My dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the 14th Annual Fireside of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. This fireside is being broadcast from the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, to attorney and student chapters throughout the world. We are grateful that you are with us this evening. My name is Virginia Isaacson, and I am the International Chair of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, and will be conducting the program this evening. I am joined on the stand by those who will participate in our program and whom I will introduce shortly. We are privileged to be joined by Elder Quinton L. Cook and Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, along with Sister Mary Cook and Sister Catherine Christofferson. President Kevin J. Worthen, President of Brigham Young University, and his wife Peggy are with us this evening. We are also pleased to have Elder Lance Wickman, General Counsel for the Church, and his wife here tonight. We are so grateful for all of their kind and unwavering support of the Law Society. In addition, seated on the stand and with us in the audience are leaders not only of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, but also leaders and members from the BYU Alumni, the Management Society, the International Society, the BYU Law Alumni, and the Political Affairs Society. This is more than symbolic and should be instructive as we work collaboratively on important issues that affect all of our members. Other leaders of academic, church, and legal communities are here with us this evening. Although we do not have time to recognize each individually, we acknowledge both their presence and their significant contributions to the Law Society, our communities, and our profession. We express appreciation to the Church's Satellite Committee, the Publishing Services Department, and the broadcast team for making this evening possible. We also want to specifically thank the Law Society's Executive Director, Mary Hoagland, and the Fireside Committee for their tireless work on this event. Perhaps most importantly, we recognize that so many of you have planned events in your own areas in connection with this broadcast. We are grateful for your efforts and for all that our local chapter leaders and members do to advance the mission of the Law Society. We will hear more of what we can do and become, not only tonight, but in a few weeks at the annual conference of the Law Society. The 11th Annual Law Society Conference will be held in San Diego, California from February 11th to the 13th. We will be privileged to hear from many wonderful speakers and presenters at that conference, and CLE credits are available. There are many legal conferences around the world, but at no other legal con conference do you feel the spirit and hear testimonies from church area legal counsel. There is a love and camaraderie within this law society that goes beyond just a legal association. I especially encourage law students to come and join us in San Diego. There are sessions dedicated just for you. If you have not already registered, please go online and register at jrcls.org. Our early registration deadline ends on January 20th, and so I urge you to sign up as soon as possible. I will not be offended at all if you turn to your mobile devices and start registering now. Just kidding, of course. I graduated from law school almost 19 years ago and headed to Washington, D.C. with my husband, Tom, to start working. I had attended some summer law society events in D.C. when I was a student, but I didn't know much about the law society. We kept getting invited to Law Society chapter events. We went to amazing brown bag lunches with great speakers, and they were free. We met wonderful people who were great mentors. It wasn't always easy to attend events or be as involved when I had young twins, but the Law Society became a professional lifeline of sorts. Through the years, our association and involvement with the Law Society grew. I am grateful for these leaders in our local chapter who invited me and became my friend. My friendship with these faithful individuals helped me professionally and personally. I know that my experience is not unique and that this same thing happens in law society chapters around the world. I am so excited by the amazing growth of the law society. We have a new chapter in Tijuana, Mexico. The country of Brazil went from one chapter in Sao Paulo to five chapters in just a few years. We recently organized a chapter in the Middle East. It is very humbling and amazing to me that this broadcast is being transmitted to chapters throughout the world. These international chapters are incredible examples of service. 
I encourage everyone to continue to reach out and welcome our students and new attorneys so that we can continue to be an influence for good around the world. Now we gather this evening not only to recognize significant acts and lives of servants, but to listen to words of inspiration as we move forward in this important work. Our program will proceed as follows. Scott Paul, Chair of the Conference and Events Committee, will offer the invocation. After the prayer, students from the S.J. Quinney College of Law will favor us with Near My God to Thee, arranged by Tamara Fackrell. Following the musical num number, the Franklin S. Richards Award for Service will be presented to the Honorable J. Clifford Wallace by Jim Rasband, Dean of the J. Roman Clark Law School and member of the Law Society Board, and Jim Moss, Chair of the Service and Outreach Committee. Elder Gary Doxey, Associate Director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies and former General Counsel to Governor Levitt will then introduce our keynote speaker, Governor Michael O. Levitt. I will then present the J. Reuben Clark Law Society's Distinguished Service Award to Governor Levitt. We are honored that he would join us this evening and we look forward to hearing his address. After Governor Levitt's remarks, Rebecca Ann Gebler, a member of the Student Chapters Board of the Law Society, will give the benediction. Following the benediction, we invite you to join us for a reception in the plaza level of the conference center. We also ask that you take all of your belongings with you at that time because the doors will be locked after this event. Scott. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be gathered here in this building and around the world on this this special evening. We are grateful for the occasion that brings us together. We are honored to, to have with us uh, Judge Wallace and Governor Levitt. We appreciate their lives of service. We look forward to hearing from them and honoring them this night. We are grateful for the Law Society that brings good people together who value the influence of faith in the practice and study of law. We are grateful for the rule of law. We pray that it will prevail. Please help us to be uh, instruments in thy hands uh, in using the, the special talents and knowledge that we have to do good in the world and to build the kingdom. We pray that the Spirit will be here with us this night, that we will be, that we will be well taught and edified. Finally, we give thanks for thy Son, Jesus Christ, for his church, for his gospel, for his atonement that brings so much joy and hope into our lives. We offer this prayer in his name, even Jesus Christ, amen.
grateful to the students of the S.J. Quinney College of Law for that beautiful music. It's my great honor this evening to present the Franklin S. Richards Award um, for Public Service to the Honorable J. Clifford Wallace of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, one of the most distinguished members of the federal judiciary and an extraordinary public servant. I had the blessing of serving as his law clerk um, back in, well, a couple of years ago, and to me personally, He'll always just be the judge and an important mentor in my life. Judge Wallace was born in San Diego, California, on the other side of the tracks. And he spent three years as a sailor in the United States Navy before returning and graduating from San Diego State. He then received his law degree from the University of California, Berkeley, Bolt Hall School of Law. Following law school, he entered law practice in San Diego until he was confirmed by the United States Senate in 1970 to serve as a judge on the United States District Court for the Southern District of California. In 1972, he was elevated to the Ninth Circuit, and he has served on the Ninth Circuit for almost 44 years, serving as Chief Judge from 1991 to 96, and assuming senior status in 1996. Now, one of the criteria for the Franklin S. Richards Public Service Award is, quote, outreach which fosters greater understanding and compliance with the rule of law and actions and influence which improve the legal community's ability to provide service for all, close quote. It would be hard, frankly, to find someone who has done more than Judge Wallace to promote the rule of law and the administration of justice. Judge Wallace's efforts to improve the quality of judicial administration in the United States have been unstinting. I could, quite literally, um, spend 20 minutes listing the commissions, the committees, and projects in which he's been involved to improve our court system. So much of that work is not glamorous. Rules of court procedure, judicial discipline, effective calendaring, finding ways to reduce time from initial judgment and filing to appeal, uh, developing a department for pro, pro se cases and securing pro bono representation for pro se cases that need argument. But if that work hasn't always been glamorous, it's been absolutely critical. Justice disorganized and justice long delayed is rarely justice at all. Now, I could go on about his domestic efforts or his many accomplishments. Um, he's given commencement addresses, invited lectures at law schools and universities across the country. He has dozens of law review articles to his credit. He's been a champion of religious liberty, a fundamental ideal for the law society, and where we're dedicated to the proposition that there is strength brought to, a brought to the law by a lawyer's personal religious conviction. But for all of his efforts domestically, his service that seems perhaps most fitting for the award we present tonight is his work internationally to help create functional and impartial judicial systems, particularly in developing countries. Early in his time as a federal judge, Judge Wallace began using personal vacation time to visit judiciaries overseas, and he's committed and continued to this service throughout his time on the bench. Indeed, since taking senior status, he probably spends about one and a half of his time on this effort. He's traveled over 60 countries advising judiciaries on everything from combating corruption to implementing mediation programs to staving off interference by a military president. In Thailand, for example, he helped establish a new judicial center. 
um, for training judges. In Guatemala, he helped implement a traveling court system, a judge and a mediator aboard a bus trying to serve the country's rural areas. He advised the Chinese government on a special economic court to handle business cases. As a result of his work, Judge Wallace is revered as one of the world's leading experts on judicial administration. In Bangkok, a judicial training institute that Judge Wallace helped establish now serves as a hub for judges in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. United States Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, who has traveled with Judge Wallace, tells of riding with a Thai judge who pointed to the judicial training building and said simply, Judge Wallace. And that is perhaps all I should say. In Judge Wallace, we tonight honor someone who has set an example of service worthy of our emulation. I wish I could take more time to tell you of my personal observation of his tireless work ethic, his immense and extraordinary self-discipline, and his faithfulness and love of the restored gospel. I'm grateful for his example in my life. You can understand, then, why I am truly honored to participate in giving this award to my judge, Judge Wallace. I wanted to include tonight Jim Moss, who's the chair of um, the Law Society's um, Service and Outreach Committee, who works so hard to promote um, service to the Law Society all around the world to join me at the stand, but I don't think that Jim is here. And so I will um, accept this great honor on my own to present this award and um, ask you now to join me in honoring Judge J. Clifford Wallace as the 2016 recipient of the Franklin S. Richards Award for Public Service. I want to first uh, <clears throat> thank the musicians. They sang a song which is very dear to my heart. Um, each time I hear it, um, my mind goes back 50 years to the first meeting of the regional representatives of the 12, which we were called in those days, and the Quorum of Twelve Apostles in the temple. It was probably the most spiritual meeting I've ever attended. Much happened at that time, but it was the Spirit. And when we finished, I knew I needed the Lord every hour. And with uh, Spencer W. Kimball at the piano, who could never read music but knew all the songs, playing, we sang together, most of us with tears in our eyes, I need thee every hour. And I suspect that whatever I have done by way of service is because I needed the Lord to be with me, to give me direction and inspiration. That singular event has been so important in my life that I couldn't help commenting upon it as I got the same feeling as these wonderful musicians. So along with that, I want to thank the J. Reuben Clark Society for presenting to me the Franklin S. Richards Public Service Award. When I receive a prestigious award such as this, I think of the many others who are far more deserving than I am. But as for me, it encourages me to increase my service, to perhaps one day be worthy of the award I'm receiving tonight. It's well that this presentation has been made largely before an audience of lawyers and judges, seen and unseen, to remind us all of the virtue of service and the unique value it plays in our chosen profession. I'm grateful to my friend and former law clerk, Dean James Rasband, for his generous introduction. But truth be told, you should have in mind that my law clerks all realize that the better I am considered, the more prestigious is the value of their one-year clerkship 
with minimal salary compensation. <laughs> In order to satisfy my curiosity as to why I should be considered for this important service award, I looked, as best I could, uh, to what parallels there may be in my life to that of Franklin S. Richards. And I'll briefly comment upon what I found. He stated in a speech the following, I believe that when we come to this earth, each of us has a mission to fill and a work to do, which will develop and be made manifest to us as we go along, if we will seek the, for the guidance of the Spirit of the Lord." Close quote. At each professional decision point, I could not see the end of the road, but I was aware by the Spirit of the way forward. Even in my early years before I became a member of this church, I had a strong feeling that I wanted to be a lawyer. Because my immigrant father only had a third grade education, and was inflicted with alcoholism, we grew up in a very poor neighborhood. There were no lawyers there. And indeed, I never met one before I had already made my decision. Although others, such as school counselors, advised me otherwise, I knew what my first step was to be. Franklin S. Richards was not a person of good health, and his parents reported that he hardly ever had known a day's health. Yet, he persevered in his practice of the law in defending the Church and Church members during the very troublesome polygamy years with dedication and skill. His service was not diminished by his physical problems. I, too, can identify with him in this regard, having been diagnosed with a debilitating disease in my early thirties which I still have today, although it is largely controlled by medication, at least so far. Franklin S. Richards' life shows us that we should not be discouraged from service merely because of physical challenges, but to do the best we can. Franklin S. Richards had the ability to think outside the box and solve problems by using his intellect to find solutions even though they may not have ever been used before. During the hectic polygamy days, there was a problem with how the church property should be held, and there was no useful title that could be discerned. Richards did not let that bother him, and the result was the use of the corporate soul, which was, beginning, was the beginning of the way of the practice which is still used in the church today in structuring our church holdings. The key was that he did not say, we've always done it this way. He asked the right question, is there a better way? I followed that same practice in assisting judiciaries in the United States and other countries, plus international judicial conferences and conventions. A better judicial administration way always needs to be found in every changing society so that reasonably prompt justice can be achieved and fundamental rights, such as the freedom of religion and belief, can be protected. Franklin S. Richards was benefited by a devoted wife, and they found a team that worked together in important causes they embraced, including women's suffrage. I, too, have been blessed with a dedicated partner who sees the beneficial result possible through our service to others. Finally, there can be no doubt that Franklin S. Richards was completely dedicated to the Church he served. He pledged to follow the direction of the First Presidency without question. The value of surface opens up when you allow those called to be inspired to preside provide you opportunities. I was a 29-year-old elder in the Church just beginning my law practice in a major firm and starting a married life when I was called to serve in a stake presidency. Elder Legrand Richards of the Quorum of the Twelve, now deceased, saw my, cons cons my <laughs> difficulties and gave me this counsel. Your first duty 
is to your family, and the second is to the church. And if you have any time left over, you can make a living. <laughs> now, he did expect me to be successful in the law, but he was speaking of priorities. I've tried to follow those service priorities in the decisions we make. With this in mind, I will try my best to continue in service to others and to be worthy of the recognition. Franklin S. Richards died two years earlier than I am now and was still actively practicing law. I have not retired. While there is service remaining to be done, we must never retire from being servi of service to others. In my view, service to others is just not an admirable quality beneficial to a full life. The best example of selfless service took place over 2,000 years ago in a garden called Gethsemane and on a hill named Golgotha. The reward for service is that through it we can become more like Him. With this in mind, I very humbly accept this award. Thank you. I salute the Law Society for the service that you undertake. I salute Judge Wallace, and I'm grateful for the years that I've been able to associate with him and see some of his service firsthand. I'm honored to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Governor Michael O. Levitt. As was mentioned, I had the privilege of serving for six years as his general counsel when he was governor of Utah. Mike Levitt is a native of Cedar City, Utah, where he grew up as the oldest of six boys born to Dixie and Ann Levitt. I know and admire his parents and brothers, each of whom has been outstanding in his own right. Two of his brothers, Dane and David, are alumni of the BYU Law School. After graduating from Southern Utah University, Mike followed his father into the family insurance business becoming CEO at age 34. The business has since grown to become the nation's second largest privately held insurance broker. Early on, he established a political consulting business with his partner Bud Scruggs, also an alumnus of the law school. Mike became a well-known and trusted political strategist both in Utah and nationally. In fact, I would say that thinking strategically about politics is one of his extraordinary gifts. He has, as it were, a sixth sense in evaluating political strategy, and it's absolutely fascinating to listen to his analysis if you have the chance. In 1992, at age 41, Mike Levitt was elected the 14th governor of Utah, an office, <clears throat> an office he held for most of three terms. 11 years. During this time in office, he effectuated significant improvements in the state, and Utah was hailed several times as being the best managed state in the Union. He was elected chair of the National Governors Association. Among other things, Governor Levitt was an architect of welfare reform and health insurance coverage for children of the working poor. At considerable personal political risk, he initiated the reconstruction of I-15 in Salt Lake County using an innovative design-build model that brought the project in on time and well under budget and became the envy of transportation departments nationwide. He founded Western Governors University, a nonprofit accredited online university that has pioneered the innovation, it pioneered uh, innovations in education delivery. It has 60,000 students and was called by Time Magazine in November of 2008 the best relatively cheap university you've never heard of. <laughs> Governor Levitt became a recognized voice regionally and nationally for, for a responsible and balanced approach to the environment. He improved air quality on the Colorado Plateau and in the area of the Grand Canyon. 
He kept high-level nuclear waste out of Utah in the, in the face of seemingly overwhelming odds. And of course, he led the state during the environmentally responsible 2002 Winter Olympic Games. The Games, by the way, were another enterprise in Utah that, due to Governor Levitt's politically risky intervention to bring in Mitt Romney, became a great success and came off well within budget. A special note for those seated here, Governor Levitt had a tremendous influence on the state judiciary in Utah. During his time in office, he appointed four out of five of the state Supreme Court, Supreme Court justices and over a third of the then sitting judges. Three years into his third term in late 2003, Governor Levitt stepped down from the governorship to answer President George W. Bush's call to serve as administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Two years later, the president appointed him Secretary of Health and Human Services, an office he held for four years until 2009. At the Department of Health and Human Services, he administered a budget of $750 billion, nearly 25% of the entire federal budget, and he oversaw 67,000 employees. Since leaving public office, Governor Levitt has returned to private enterprise. He's the founder and chairman of Levitt Partners, a very innovative and successful consulting firm dedicated to helping clients understand the healthcare industry and navigate the future of healthcare as they transition to new and better models. After returning to private life, he has also served in church capacities, including with the Public Affairs Committee for a number of years. As far as I'm aware, the only member of the committee who is not a general authority or general officer of the church. In that capacity, he has helped immensely with the effort to establish and to promote religious freedom, reaching out to, to leaders of other faiths and building coalitions and helping to create dialogues and, and talking points that can make a difference over time. I have to tell you the personal side. I can illustrate it with a story. I asked my wife, after telling her that I had an opportunity to introduce Governor Levitt, I asked her, so what strikes you most? And it's, she said, you used to come all home all the time and say, he's the smartest man I know. I also remembered numerous times when, in conversations, I could see the wheels turning and see a number of innovations arising in his thought process. He's by nature a collaborator, by nature a coalition builder, and by nature an entrepreneur. He can enterprise just about anything. When our son David was nine years old, I remember he had an opportunity to be with me at the governor's office, and Governor Levitt asked him what he was doing in the summer and found out he liked baseball and immediately told him that he could make quite a good living during the summer if he would offer a babysitting, a babysitting service and baseball coaching. And they put together, he and his friend put together a, a nice little uh, business of a couple of hours of, d of the day, helping the, the kids who are about six or seven years old learn how to play baseball. They got a candy bar at the end of the day, and at the end of the season, they took them to a, to a local baseball game. The mothers loved it. It was a terrific service. But David, nine years old, made off with a few hundred dollars that summer for doing something he just enjoyed. Mike Levitt is a man of integrity. I was always impressed and had the utmost trust that he would stay the course, serve that those principles that are highest, and that he was ultimately dedicated to God, his family, and the church. As a true statesman, he has accomplished much, but I have to say that I'm sure his greatest accomplishment, and the one he would agree is the most important, is that he was able to win and marry, win the hand of Jacqueline Smith and who is here with him tonight. And together they have five children, a beautiful family. We love them. We're grateful to be with them. I am 
grateful and thankful to introduce Governor Michael O. Levitt, but I first want to turn the podium over to Virginia Smith for presentation of the award. Thank you for your wonderful introduction, Elder Doxy. Um, it is my great privilege now to present the J. Ruben Clark Law Society's Distinguished Service Award to Governor Michael Levitt. I would invite Governor Levitt to come forward, and I would like to ask Mary Hoagland, the Executive Director of the Law Society, to help me present the award. I must say, first of Judge Wallace, I have been aware for years of his distinguished demeanor, his unpeachable integrity, his unflagging wisdom. But having spent time in his presence, I'm also aware of his human kindness, and I want to congratulate him and thank uh, J. Reuben Clark Society for a law society for honoring him for all of us. To the society, I would also thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, distinguished event. While tonight uh, you have honored my service, I would like to first declare that your noble mission serves us all. I am reminded in that context of an old Australian saying, rooster today, feather duster tomorrow. Uh, now being in the feather duster phase of my life, it's nice to have uh, s such a, a kind gesture. But tonight I would, I would like to uh, talk a bit about some experiences that I've had in my public service. And I'd like to talk about leaders that I have met. Some good, some not so good. But before I do that, I would like to just also thank Gary Doxey for his very kind introduction. Gary is a wonderful friend. As he was speaking, however, my memory turned to one of my favorite events while I was governor. We called it the Centenarian Event, and each spring we would invite anyone who had turned 100 years of age or older to come to the governor's residence where we would celebrate their lives. Now, each year, uh, there was something notable and memorable. But what I was thinking about is that the, one of the oldest people to come was uh, Gary's uh, uh, wife, Debbie's grandfather, Kenneth Burnett, who was 105 years old and stood and regaled us with poetry. On another year, there was a man who was 102. His wife was a mere 99. They had been married for 77 years. That is exactly the way I responded. <laughs> I said, 77 years, that is a long time. And to demonstrate that you never lose your sense of humor, he said in a voice about like this, it is a long time. <laughs> but we're going to get a divorce. I said, after 77 years, you're going to get a divorce? Why now? Because we wanted to wait until the kids were dead. <laughs> now, I, Jackie and I are at 43, and I am holding on to use that line on my own someday. In September of the first year that Jackie and I served, um, we were in Washington, D.C., where I had to attend some meetings at the White House. There were, at the time, quiet negotiations that had been going on for months between the PLO and Israel. And as it turned out, they had struck a deal and had arranged to come to the United States in which to, uh, to announce it. The announcement would be made by 
the chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Army, Yasser Arafat, and Yitzhak Rabin, who was at the time the Prime Minister uh, of Israel and the Minister of Defense. Now, all of us are aware of the centuries of conflict between Arabs and Jews. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin had been made the Prime Minister in 1991, and he had come on with the idea of finding peace. He had immediately begun to withdraw or discontinue the development of settlements uh, in the Golan Heights and on the West Bank. And they had reached agreement on a set of governing principles, principles that they hoped would bring peace, or at least a process toward peace. We were invited to attend the signing of that ceremony. Jackie and I were ushered to the front row, where we sat right at the edge of the table where they were to sign. There was a bit of a delay, and everyone wondered if there had been a diplomatic snag but finally, a voice said, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of Israel, and the Chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Army. All three of them emerged simultaneously from the diplomatic entrance of the White House. President Clinton was in the middle. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Rabin was on his right, best dressed in a business suit, and on his left was Yasser Arafat with his familiar checked headscarf. I remember there being applause, but no music, and the three of them walked across the South Lawn. Each of them sat at opposite ends of a large wood table on a small stage. The president spoke, and then Yasser Arafat spoke. And then Yitzhak Rabin, the former top-ranking general for the Israeli army, approached the podium. His demeanor and his words were somber. There was no sense of celebration on this occasion for him. His words were unforgettable to me. We are soldiers who have returned from battle stained with blood, he said. We have seen our relatives and our friends killed before our eyes. We have fought against you, the Palestinians. But we say to you today in a loud and clear voice, enough blood and tears, enough. We must give peace a chance. It was time to, serve, to sign the agreement. An eerie silence fell across the South Lawn of the White House. As an undertone to that silence, you could hear hovering helicopters, symbolizing and underscoring the security concerns of an event like that. I could see the American flag flying above the Eisenhower office building. It was a beautiful September day in Washington, D.C. It was significant to me that while the United States had not been fully involved in these negotiations, that it was the United States where they came to announce it because they knew how important the United States was in the context of such an agreement. Simultaneously, you could hear the click of hundreds of cameras with every move of their arm, the world watched. And as they did, there were protesters in Lafayette Park who were chanting their disapproval and opposition to the agreement that they were just about to sign. They signed the document. They pushed themselves away from the table. And then the world watched to see if these two bitter enemies, who represented civilizations who were at war for hundreds of years, would shake hands. You probably remember the picture of the President of the United States with his arms outstretched, Yasser Arafat on his left, Yitzhak Rabin on his right, and they shook hands. 
It was a moment of history. The enemies of that agreement were many. And in a tragic postscript, two years later, Yixof Rabin was killed by an assassin's bullet while he attended a rally supporting the implementation of the principles that were contained in that agreement. The Middle East, of course, continues to be increasingly a complex place. Uh, scholars and diplomats uh, throughout decades since and, and, and after and, and, and in the future will debate on whether that agreement was meaningful or not. But I know this. Yixov Rabin remains in my mind as a symbol of statesmanlike leadership. My next story requires just a little lesson on history, the history of Central America, and I want to tell you about an unlikely friendship that I formed over the course of time. During the 1980s, many of you will remember a, a young Marxist dictator in Nicaragua by the name of Daniel Ortega. Daniel Ortega, at the age of 15 years old, uh, was arrested for political misbehavior. He immediately joined an underground group called the Sandinistas. At age 22, he was convicted of robbing a bank it was a Bank of America branch, and he was brandishing a machine gun as he, he did it. Reportedly, as he served a sentence for that uh, crime, he was beaten and he was tortured as a, in a way that fueled his anti-government feelings in a dramatic way. When he left prison, he was sent into exile and went to Cuba, where he was taught guerrilla warfare tactics, and he returned secretly months later to Nicaragua, where he began a relationship or continued a relationship with the Sandinistas. The Sandinista organization, like many others, was more than a political party. It attracted members by helping them find employment, by giving them support with such basics as health care and food and housing. In exchange for that basic support, its members were expected to support their military goals of insurrection. During the years of 19, the 70s, or many of you will remember that Ortega and the Sandinistas ultimately overthrew the, the government with a revolution, and they took possession by force, not just of the government, but many of the private properties that were owned by people uh, in Nicaragua. Their stated goal was to spread their Marxist revol revolution throughout the rest of Central America. Now, just how the United States should respond to this had become a matter of great controversy. It was a significant political issue. Many in Congress wanted the United States to intervene. Uh, others still worry of the kind of bruising impact that, uh, this, that the Vietnam War had had on this, on this nation wanted no part of another another intervention militarily. Congress ultimately made the decision that there would be no U.S. assets used in the conflict and that it would be illegal to do so. And many of you will recall a young lieutenant colonel by the name of Oliver North who served President Reagan at the time as the National Security Advisor. North apparently began to use various means of supporting the opposition uh, 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 to the Sandinistas, a group called the Contras who were bitter enemies of uh, Daniel Ortega and the Sandinistas. And a kind of scandal broke out in the second term, uh, term of the Reagan administration because of Oliver North's uh, uh, perceived support of them. Ortega and the Sandinistas, however, overtook the government and continued to control the government until the 1990s. And by that time, the, the, their, their governance had so destroyed the economy of Nicaragua that the people simply had had all they wanted of Daniel Ortega, and he, was, and he lost control of the government, and the country began to move back toward democracy. So now out of government, Daniel Ortega was still the head of the Sandinista party. But he knew he had to change his game, and so he made two 
very pragmatic moves. The first is he became a member of the Catholic Church, which is the predominant religion in Nicaragua. And second, he began to politically shift his ideology of his party, the Sandinistas, from one, uh, one of Marxism to simply democratic socialism. He then became a candidate for the presidency of Nicaragua in 1996 and in 2001, losing both times in a very similar way. Because the country had many parties, to become president, it was the law that the party had to receive and the candidate had to receive 45% of the, of the popular vote or face a runoff. And each time he ran, Daniel Ortega would get 38% short of the 45 and in the runoff election, everyone would vote against him and he would fall short of the presidency. In 1996, uh, a man by the name of Arnaldo Ailman was elected president. He was the leader of Nicaragua's most conservative party. He was a businessman, and in the 1980s, he had been a bitter opponent of the Sandinistas. So this had to be a kind of difficult defeat uh, for Daniel Ortega. Ailman was, by all accounts, a fairly good on the, for the economy. But he got entangled in scandal and he was defeated in 2001, just like Ortega had been. Ailman was then convicted of, of, cor of a corruption charge and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. So uh, Ailman's conservative party saw his convictions actually as being, as being po uh, political. And many of his supporters in the Congress stuck with him. And Daniel Ortega saw an opportunity. Ortega was the far left Sandinistas. Ailman was the far right, most conservative party. Uh, Ortega proposed what they referred to in Nicaragua as the El Paco. They brought the left and the right together, and together they had enough votes to control the Congress in their legislative branch, and among their first projects was to change the election laws so that the percentage to get elected president was no longer 45%, but 38%. <laughs> so in the 2006 election, Daniel Ortega once again ran, got his customary 38 percent, but this time it was enough to be elected president and Daniel Ortega was president of Nicaragua again, but this time there was no revolution. He was democratically elected. Now that presented a very complex diplomatic situation for the United States. We like to support countries that practice democracy. His campaign had made some friendly gestures to the United States. But there was nothing in his background that would cause one to conclude that he would be a friend to democracy or to the United States. Now, I was at the time Secretary of Health and Human Services. I had spent a lot of time in Central America dealing with a whole array of issues in food safety and pandemic preparation and general health diplomacy. The White House during that time had been completely focused on the Middle East and the war, and I had repeatedly gone to the White House and I'd said to the President, I am deeply concerned about what's happening in Central America. I can feel the last 30 years of progress beginning to slip away in terms of its leaning toward democracy, and I suggested that they might want to make a presidential visit to Central America just to fly the flag. Um, the, the question then had to be asked, should the United States send a delegation to Nicaragua to the inauguration of Daniel Ortega? The president said, Levitt talks a lot about this, let's send him. <laughs> so I got a call from the White House. 
indicating that I would be representing the President of the United States at the inauguration of President Daniel Ortega. I led a dele delegation to Managua, the capital city, and time will not, uh, will not allow me to tell all of the circumstances of that event, but I will say that I just mention a couple. I was asked to visit President-elect Daniel Ortega at the headquarters of the Sandinistas. It was a almost residential looking kind of dwelling, a, a, a building in a neighborhood. I was greeted by his wife, who was a kind of new age spiritual, a, a, a new age spiritual person. She had painted the walls with all kinds of different colors and a giant seeing eye uh, that could look at all of us. Uh, I, I tried to keep the conversation actually more personal uh, and to get acquainted with them as opposed to uh, dealing with anything diplomatic. I just wanted him to know that the United States was there. I actually kind of enjoyed him, and we had a very thoughtful and, and pleasant conversation. And the next day, it was the inauguration. It was a very hot day, as it tends to be that time of year in, in Managua. The meeting was outside. It was to start at 1 o'clock. At 1.30, it hadn't started. At 1.45, it hadn't started. And finally, at 2 o'clock, we were invited to go into a small building as diplomatic visitors uh, to, to wait. Before we had gone in, however, I began to talk to the man next to me, who introduced himself as Arnaldo Altman, who was the former president of the country of Nicaragua. I thought he was in jail on a 20-year sentence. It turns out that shortly after this El Paco had been made, he was granted house arrest and then suddenly began to receive more and more extended medical leave grants to the extent that now he was sitting next to the, rep the, the representative of the President of the United States at the country's inauguration. Uh, a very convenient deal for both the left and the right. Well, when we got inside, we realized that the reason that this was, in fact, being delayed is because a very important guest had not arrived. Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, was coming to the, to the uh, inauguration, and Comrade Chavez had not yet arrived, and we could not start without him. Uh, as I learned later, he was an important guest because in that region he played big because of oil. It turned out that the campaign of the Sandinistas had been financed through a very clever financing mechanism where Mr. Chavez had made a donation to the Sandinistas of a very large amount of oil, which was then represented as a gift to the people at a price that was slightly below where they could otherwise pay for it, but they got it for free, and so the entire campaign of the Sandinistas was essentially paid for through the sale of that oil. And so there was a very, he was a very important guest. In fact, he was the keynote speaker and sort of uh, stole the show. Now, the United States was not having many diplomatic discussions with Hugo Chavez at that time, as you might remember. But there I was in a small room with Daniel Ortega who approached me to introduce me to Hugo Chavez. I could hear a interpreter behind me interpreting what was being said between the two of them. And he introduced me as the guy from the United States. He's a fairly nice man. You'll like to meet him. <laughs> Chavez walked straight to me and walked up uncomfortably close so as to play his normal role uh, as, frankly, a big, blustery bully. And he said to me, without any other introduction, how is the infant mortality in the United States? And I, having absolutely no idea how to answer that question, I said, it's improving. How about Venezuela? <laughs> he said, we have problems, but in Cuba, that's where they're doing it well. Uh, we had, I think I may have been one of the few U.S. diplomats or, or, or representatives to have a, such a conversation during that period with Hugo Chavez. 
Well, I mention these two because I, these two experiences, because they are two very different types of leaders. I remember one of them as being a statesman, that is Yitzhak Rabin. I remember the other, Daniel Ortega, as being a very skilled gamesman. Statesmanship to me is doing the right thing because it is the right thing. Gamesmanship is just figuring out how to win at all costs. Now, the reality is that in the real, in the real world of politics, effective leaders have to be both statesmen and gamesmen. A statesman incapable of understanding how to find a way to win within the rules accomplishes nothing. And it's been my observation that every political leader is working through a constant uh, uh, zero-sum game of balancing those two. From my own experience, I will tell you that when you are this much statesman and just a little bit gamesman, you find satisfaction. The higher the degree of your gamesmanship, the less comfortable you become. I mention that because I've been talking about politics, but could I say that we're all in politics? Politics is not just about leading governments. It's about any time there is a decision to be made about, among people about splitting up money and influence. There's politics in the arts. There's politics in education. There's politics in medicine. There's politics in the law. So tonight I leave you with this challenge. Let us be statesmen. Let us be, follow the admonition of the scripture to be, uh, to, to, to be able to follow the, uh, our way to what is right. And I tell you that when we do, we will feel in our heart that it's right. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this evening. We are so grateful for the counsel and the instruction that we have received this night and for the guidance that the J. Ruben Clark Law Society gives to us. We are grateful for the spirit that we have also felt and please help us to ignite within us the desire to serve and to reach out to those around us that are in need of our service. Um, please help us to travel home in safety this evening. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.